there it was a a mild uh, typographical error. This is response of simple polymer structures and concrete under dynamic loading. So one thing that you may have noticed in the lectures uh, I've given, often they refer to um, different research that I've been connected with. Um, this is the most recent research I've been connected with. Um, and probably covers the last something things that happened things that have happened in the last uh, well just up until pre-COVID. So the um, the last of the presentations here were given a material that has been presented in 2019, and then since 2020, it's mainly been away from the laboratory and doing other things. So this is the contents. We're going to look at polymers. You've seen a lot of polymers from me in the last. Um, week. Hopefully by now you're very familiar with the kind of approach I'm going to be using. Um, and here we're going to look at damage as a um, function of uh, size and temperature in a very simple structure. In this case, it's a polymer cylinder. And we are also then going to look at uh, damage in concrete. Uh, where we use microwaves to control the static damage in the system and we look at ballistic effects and imaging and try to arrive at a parameter which helps us uh, measure damage. Now the way I think of damage and some of my colleagues think of damage is that damage is a form of a structure that is produced in the material and that structure is the result of a process and those, those properties of damage tend to be based around bond breakage or um, about bond breakage. However, we also produce structures um, which are not just blocks of material, they themselves have a structure within them and that is a desirable structure. So basically damage is a structure in the material as a shape, it has a form, but it's undesirable. Okay, so what I'm saying is damage is a structure in itself, and therefore we can use the techniques we generally apply to look at the structure of materials to also look at the damage uh, in material. Okay, so you've seen this slide before, Hopkinson bar, uh, various ideas that we get divergent behavior um, with, uh, at the intermediate strain rates, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 for a range of polymer structures. But also, this data here said there was divergent material behavior. It was not just simply crack formation. Now, crack is a crack is a form of damage, fairly obviously, uh, probably the one we think about most. And I said there was a temperature time superposition for the uh, mechanical flow of the material, for the maximum stress in the material. So the question is, I think we can look at, is there a connection between damage, drain rate, and for polymers, because polymers are very temperature dependent, temperature. Is there something similar that we see in this situation? Okay, that is the, the question. So we went for a very simple, well-studied material because we wanted material where there was lots of data available. So we were not going to be in a situation where we have to start characterizing the material from zero and then look at damage in it. So I went for first specs because it's well characterized, because it's transparent and we can take photographs of cracks growing, etc. cetera. Um, and also we can, by changing the temperature, examine more subtle effects of uh, damage under dynamic loading. And you can do things like use stress by refringence or phospholoids to show the stress field. In this case, it's a polymer disc. It has a um, six axial holes around the uh, the center, around the uh, center there of that disc. We're looking from the top. Um, and you can leave the stress by refringence in place, or you can take your first spec sample and anneal it at a low temperature, say 100 degrees centigrade, and remove the residual stress in the system. So you can, in a limited way, 
control the dynamic loading. You could even heat the material up, load it, let it cool down, and lock in different types of stress field. So all of these things are possible. And we can look at the effect of changing the structure on the response of the material. The aim here is not to um, just look at induced damage in the form of um, cracks in the system. We can also look at damage in the terms of voids in the system. So what we had was a number of uh, samples. And here we see they're all taking the form of perspex disks. And we've drilled holes of different diameter into the material. And, you know, and down the bottom there, you can see uh, on, on the road, we see we've drilled multiple holes. Um, and then finally, we've drilled a hole just from the side. Um, and basically, we've taken that system and we then put it in the Hopkinson bar as a controlled loading system. So we can put its stress pulses into it and uh, basically gently increase the impact velocities until we induce fracture in the system. So that gives you an idea. Now the sample size was based upon a, um, a thesis where somebody examined the relationship between Poisson's uh, modulus, sample size, and inter sample size and internal structure. And this 11 by 6 tended to have this ratio of around about 0.4 um, between the um, between the cross-sectional area and the height. The cross-sectional area, of course, changes with the central bore. So we've gone for something that's kind of in the middle here. Uh, and that is why we have these particular sample sizes and shapes, depends on the material properties. Um, and afterwards, um, this is the kind of damage we find. We find a lot of wedge formation. So you can see some wedges that have been popped out of the sample under the different loadings. And you can see for the multi holes uh, system that uh, the holes themselves tend to capture cracks and you get more um, more uh, diverse cracking. But if you look at the bottom row, you see a nice kind of wedge system. Then you see a, um, a system where there was a central hole and you can see this wedge is still very obvious, this little cone of material is still fairly obvious in the system. And then as you go to the transverse hole, basically there's no more cone formation, simply fractures. So absolutely straightforward. So typical, typical Hopkinson bar operation, you launch a, a striker, it's an input bar, you measure the velocity because the bar crosses a couple of um, laser beams and that gives you the velocity of the impactor. You cause impact on the sample, which then breaks or damages in some way, and you get a pulse reflected up the input bar and transmitted into the output bar. And in this case, we were very keen to have a momentum trap to um, take away uh, the uh, reflected energy from the end of the bar, and so that the sample was loaded only once. And here on the oscilloscope, you can see the outputs from those um, gauges. So there's a reasonable amount of energy transmitted, and you can also see a reasonable amount of very little reflected uh, in this case. Um, remember, we are not shattering the sample, we're only tapping it, and we hit it up until the point at which it finally breaks. So we expect to see fairly good transmission of, of stress um, if we um, keep the sample intact. And stress transmission, you could say, is a form of, of damage, is a form of measure of damage because the amount of energy transmitted implies that that energy has gone through the sample and out the far side. If we were causing damage inside the sample, that takes energy. Because it takes energy, then that energy will express itself in deforming the structure, fracturing the structure, things like that. So good energy transmission generally means the material is not damaged. So we analyze the, the gauge data and we do some high speed photography. And uh, here we see one of my typical errors. Um, when I change the size of things, I just move it over. And there you go. That is the breaking point. Okay, let's go back into the presentation. That is the breaking point uh, of the sample. And here is the engineering stress strain curve of a sample with a one millimeter axial hole. So one millimeter hole directly along the axis. There it is. 
Um, and you find this kind of response for all of the samples. So they are self-similar. So if you look at the fracture of the system with no holes, this is this is what we see there. You see the sample, you put some load on it, put more load on it, and eventually you see uh, cracking around and it finally kind of explodes on you. Uh, and that is the kind of um, response you get from the system again with that breaking point uh, scene. So that was a system with no holes. The previous one is a system with a hole in it. But you'll see there is a quite similar um, basic shape to those um, curves. Now, when um, we did the samples with the different hole size, we found there was some a little bit of bending. There was a lot of wedge formation, and there was um, cone formation in the system. And that cone tended to be at an angle of 30 degrees off the longitudinal axis of the axis central axis of the sample um, throughout all the samples we used. And so an example of um, a, some, a, a system which bends and then cracking starts forming. Here's an example of the wedge uh, that you get out of the system, the cone you get out of the system. And then if you keep on pushing it, you will fragment that cone into smaller pieces. And uh, there is a one that we actually uh, took those little cones and we made it back together to form that like structure so these this is shows increasing uh, aggression on the on the sample and you can see how the damage builds up and that's a side view just to give you an idea of um, the, the fact that the uh, crack formed at the outer edge of or ran to the outer edge of the sample so we had a look at the effect of the axial hole size and we adjusted for cross-sectional area now, the important thing here is if you've got an 11 mil millimeter uh, diameter sample, well, you can square 11 and get 121. If there's a hole down the middle, which is one millimeter in diameter, that's got an area of one. So the change in um, the uh, sample um, cross sectional area is less than uh, 1% when we drill a one millimeter hole down the middle. Why do I go on about that? It is because you get this kind of response. So the sample without the hole, um, on average, transmits around about 250, 260 in this case, um, megapascals of force before it breaks. With the one millimeter hole, it's around about 300. That was the highest point, uh, around about 300 megapascals. And that is caused by a less than 1% change in the cross-sectional area which means that we're getting a much bigger response here uh, in terms of the uh, fracture stress. And for the uh, nine millimeter hole, well, again, we've taken away a lot of material there, nine millimeters away from 11 millimeters. There's only a two millimeter outer shell, but that two millimeter outer shell, as you see, is supporting in terms of area, it's about 200 megapascals. So it's still doing a pretty good job. So if we look at 50% uh, fairly probability and draw a uh, drop a table, then this is the kind of graph we get. So the system without the hole is the red line. And as you see, um, you'll notice that, you know, I'm, I'm saying there's a probability of fracture there when you uh, don't have any stress on the floor or transmitted stress on the floor. There were a few samples that cracked very early on and the, the stresses were down near zero, but not much data there. But you can kind of get the idea that if you're looking at 50% um, fracture probability, then you're, you're for the one, the system with uh, out the hole, that 50% is kind of over here. It's around about 250 or so. If you had a, a system with a nine millimeter hole, then basically it's a lot weaker. Um, so you can get to 50% fracture probability of around about 160, 170. Uh, megapascals of transmitted stress. However, when you started drilling holes into the system, so uh, a one millimeter axial hole, you see that the 50, firstly, the hole curve is shifted over and the rise is over a smaller region. So that's important. Also, the um, Stress required to get a 50% chance of failure 
um, for that hole is round about 280 or so, 290 or so um, megapascals. And with the nine one millimeter radial hole, you'll see that the 50% chance is slightly weakened compared to this one. But again, it's a kind of rise. So by drilling that hole, we have um, narrowed down the um, range over which we go from no damage to the whole system shattering. So yes, that, 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 that's interesting in itself. And also you can see the one millimeter hole along the axis has a much higher failure, 50 percent failure probability. You can tell me, and I agree, that there will be some examples of material without a hole which will survive to very high stress, and that is absolutely true. Um, however, if we're looking at anything, you know, if we're doing an engineering kind of study and we're worried about damage levels of the order of say 10%, then really this kind of indicates um, the level of surety you can have for these different systems. Now, because we're doing failure probability and because we're always told in the books that there is a distribution of flaws in the sample, there is some statistical variation, we went and did uh, quite a number of experiments and kind of here we see the results of this. We were looking for 50% failure probability because we wanted to make it easy for ourselves. We could have made it harder for ourselves and gone for 5% probability of failure, but this was an easy one to go for. Uh, but as you see, you know, 200 plus experiments, sorry, and these are the kind of average transmitted stress. There's a reasonable small degree of error bars here, but you're like 290, 250, um, 230, and 165 are the kind of numbers we are hitting. Um, now, if you decided to heat the system, and now you have a uh, oven around the Hopkinson bar, you heat it up, you have thermal couples in there, you do some calibration studies where you have a thermal couple where the sample will be in contact with the sample and another thermal couple in the box. And then you do the experiment where you take the thermal couple that is touching the sample area away and you then use the uh, a calibration curve between uh, those systems and you find the sample of the temperature compared to the sample of the box. Um, why is there this difference? Well, the sample is, in touch, in, is touching two metal bars which extend outside of the heating area, which means that there is a cooling mechanism occurring as well. But this is the, um, and we've got fans going, this is the kind of average temperature. We wait until there's a, a fairly good thermal equilibrium in the system, and we measure temperature in the middle of the sample and at the ends of the sample, and make sure there's no big thermal gradients. So basically we do some fairly straightforward calibration of the temperature. And we use the basic split Hopkinson pressure bar analysis, where we use the input pulse, the transmitting pulse, and therefore we can work out the uh, stress and strain of the system. We always used for the sake of uh, consistency, engineering stress, engineering strain. We were aiming to see what things were like compared to the original shape of the system. And then we also worked out the time to uh, sample uh, equilibrium um, in the system as well. So those are the kind of um, analysis we're doing, very straightforward. This, this is so as a kind of a data we capture from the disks, the transmitted stress uh, versus time for an unbroken uh, system, transmitted uh, stress versus time for a system which broke. You can see that there is a kind of a flat period in the in the response of the system. That's what we took as the maximum transmitted stress. Um, you can see there's a, a, a difference in the shape of the system. Um, so. That was what we uh, what we took um, as the uh, system failing, and the, the the black lines there indicate the times at which the system was in stress equilibrium. Okay. Uh, and then we did it with the actual hole, and again we can see you know failure, uh, etc. Undamaged sample, 50 degrees C smashed, um, and then another one on the right with the breaking stress and breaking strain in the system. That's what we were capturing. And if we look at the relationship between the average breaking strain and the sample temperature for undamaged samples, 
you will find that um, actually it seems to plateau for the undamaged samples round about um, 0.36 or so. And then as we get to uh, 45 degree, 45 degrees centigrade, 46, you can see there is a rise. And then for the um, samples with the actual holes, you can see there is a, um, a rise uh, that's more steady and there doesn't appear to be a, a jump off um, of the response at any particular point. But you can, you can draw lines through these and find the relationships. Now the results in stress are, in my opinion, uh, far more interesting. The maximum stress at 50% probability of failure and temperature in the samples that had no hole in them, you can see they start off at around about 285, goes long, it dips down a little bit and then kind of jumps up again. Okay. On the right hand side, you can see it starts off at a slightly higher because putting that little hole in the system is gives the material extra strength. And you can see now it's around about 290 or so, and we uh, heat the system up. And you can see there is a dip around about the same point at about 38 degrees centigrade, followed by a rise again at um, 43. Now, there are 10 points per sample in this graph. And the error bars are uh, fairly small. You saw the size of the error bar. So each one of these is repeated. Um, so each this graph represents 100. Um, these graphs represent 100 experiments. Um, we were very interested in seeing how the damage occurred in the system. So we looked at the lighting and high speed photography. So on one side, we have just normal light. So a flat light source illuminating the sample. This is the perspex, and you can see a black line across the middle, and that is due to using planar light on a curved surface. There's no hole in that sample. That's just an effect of the illumination. On the right-hand side, we use cylindrical diffused light in order to illuminate all parts of the surface evenly and get a good uh, level of see-through. And this shows the... Um, an effect of just using normal planar light on uh, one side, on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, we had multiple light sources um, illuminating the surface. And this was done in collaboration with a couple of intern students, uh, Gautier and Bertrand, from the University of Lorraine or in France. So basically, that is what they did. And um, here are some of the results you get. So this um, image shows a sample in a Hopkinson bar and it gets smashed and uh, not a lot you can do for that very good so let us hit that system with less aggression let's let's take that impact velocity down a little bit and see what we get here so here we have a system that hits and doesn't break it just stays intact you could pick that up afterwards let's increase that velocity a little bit and see what we get there so we have uh, did the impact and there a single crack is formed in that system and you could see quite clearly which side of the system that crack actually came from and it's quite uh, instructive so let's have a look at the samples with the with the holes in it and so here we have some with the hole in it and you can see there and there that a crack has been developed. So let's play that again. There you go. Very soon, early on in the system, you get a crack forming at this point here. Let's do that again. Different sample. Um, there you go. Very early on, you get that crack forming around that central cavity. What are we showing here? Well, we're showing that the initial crack we're getting is different in these two situations. Crack but it initiates itself into, and we repeat this experiment to show this has some statistical validity. So for the polymer conclusions, the initial failure is due to shear. It's uh, on, the, on the disk sample, the combination of the compressive loading force and the tensile strain due to the lateral expansion of the sample. Um, there's a Hertzian style comb, called it Hertzian style. Hertzian style comb formed before fracturing into wedges. 
The one millimeter central hole supported the higher stress and strain, i.e., you got between five to ten percent higher stresses if you had that one central that central hole. That is because stress does not concentrate at the center of the sample. That compressive stress is confined to the central hole, the surface of the central hole. And the other material is stronger. So engineering works. Having a structure means you can be stronger than the simple material in itself. It also affects how that material damages. Now, the extra holes we used around the uh, the edge of the, uh, the the disc so the whole the one we have six holes around the um the central axis did show increased load bearing capacity but only if a central hole was present if that central hole was not present um you did not see any marked effect but having that central hole makes the effect and then having those other holes modifies that effect. So here it's good old stress concentration thing. The transverse holes really don't do much. They weaken the sample. Um, they help uh, cracks form. They can capture some cracks. We've seen that in high speed photography, but basically it's a much weaker system. Now, if you look at the effects of temperature over our fairly small temperature range, um, you see there are trends in the breaking strain, the maximum strain, and the strain relationship with temperature. You see a dip, uh, in this case, around about 42 degrees centigrade. Now, we know from the work of Wally and Field, what's the work of Wally and Field? I'll just go back there, show you that graph again. What I say is, we know temperature is linked to strain rate. That, in some cases, like that in other cases, and what do we see here is a relationship with temperature, failure stress with strain rate, which is, I eventually get to it, apologies there, for this, which uh, actually, oh look, it's kind of going, and then it goes down. So this, to me, and this is what we need to follow up on, what we want to follow up on is, is this um, an example of a switch in the failure mode of the samples? And it's related to the material um, flow stress, which is affected by temperature. Question mark, okay? Question mark, still needs more work to, to sort this out. But there, there we're kind of going with that. So those are our conclusions from uh, polymers. Now, you can tell me that putting a hole in a, a simple polymer disc does not reflect the complexity of the real world. And I will tell you that in many situations, you are very correct. A lot of the built environment tends to use materials like concrete, which are very heterogeneous um, and also quite brittle. Glass is relatively flexible, but um, concrete is you know, quite brittle in itself. Um, and we put different types of strengtheners within that concrete. We put reinforcing steel. So we were funded by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, which is a United States agency, to um, look at the um, effect of damage on concrete and try and find a measure of damage in the concrete. So we adopted a particular approach because of my experience in the quarrying and mining industry. I knew that microwaves had been looked at as a form of introducing, introducing damage, reducing the strength of minerals from the ground um, in order to reduce the energy that you spend processing those minerals. So microwaves produce damage in uh, materials due to either water being heated differential heating between the aggregate and the cement matrix and also chemical reactions so microwaves have a number of mechanisms by which they can cause differential thermal expansion in the material or develop internal pressure through excitation of water within the material causing pressure which can lead to cracks so 
Strike Wave seemed like a good way. And here we have um, an example showing some pyrite grains. So in inside a mineral matrix, and we can see they've all heated up quite well um, on exposure to microwaves, whilst the matrix uh, hasn't heated up at all. Um, you can look up the thermal conductivities of these materials, calcite and pyrite, see what, see what effects there are. And you can see the effects of strength reduction in the radiation of the, uh, in this case, concrete with um, microwaves. The important thing for this study is that irradiation does not change the shape of the sample. Often when people introduce mechanical damage into a system, they do this by using a mechanical stimulus, which ultimately changes the shape of the sample in some way. Here we've got a sample, uh, here we have a system which introduces cracks thermally. We can heat using the microwaves, individual particles within the system up without bulk heating system, cause some cracking and then let the system cool down again and we've introduced those cracks and the sample retains its shape, which is a big thing for us. Um, you can use uh, different types of uh, concrete and look at the change in terms of the peak load to failure. And you can see um, sometimes like limestone actually seems to get stronger because of the stimulated reaction between the, the limestone and the, um, and the matrix. In other cases, um, as you say, limestone upper, you basically uh, find there is a, a change. There. So you can monitor these changes. And you can do micros uh, my microscopy of the system and look for the different forms of micro cracks uh, introduced in the system. And here we have an example of transgranular and interface cracking and boundary cracking introduced by microwaves in the system. So what we did was we chose a particular mix, was, which was a ultra high performance concrete. Um, it has low porosity in uh, sample sizes. Uh, that means uh, less than a fraction of a percent. And um, porosity has a big effect on um, the response of uh, concrete. So we wanted to make sure we kept our porosity really low and we controlled it. We could also cast this material in vacuum, vacua to again keep those pores small. We could vibrate and shake the, the system while it's still um, soft. Uh, basically, we could do a lot of things to uh, control it. And we worked with people who work with cement and concrete structures in order to um, study the, uh, the system. And we did this, these experiments over a series of years, allowing us to check that uh, the evolution of the concrete was um, as expected. Concrete is a material that takes years and years to fully cure. So this shows us uh, some uh, perspex again. We love perspex where we cut some holes in it using a laser, and that allowed us to make arbitrary, arbitrary shape, uh, shapes. We bolted that PMMA onto a metal base, and then we cast our material into it. And then we removed the um, the uh, concrete from the PMMA, uh, basically by using very mild heat on the system, um, because the PMMA expanded and the uh, first and the concrete basically dropped out of the uh, system. You could try uh, other ways of mechanically pushing the uh, the concrete out, but that was far more damaging than just using a, a material that just thermally expands away from the uh, the sample, and you could just push them out with your own hands. So we, we looked um, for different um, composites. So we had chalk powder, we had steel filings, we had silica fines and silica fume, as it's called, which is a, basically a fume is material that can be carried by the air. So that's less than 10 microns. And here we have some examples of the kind of steel uh, rods we added at one point and the, uh, the chalk we had as well. And we did some initial calculation um, using on the microwaves and looking at the heat that would be developed within a uh, sample in terms of the surface temperature. And uh, here we see that we can easily get up to several hundred uh, degrees in the in the system. And uh, we could learn out where to put the sample in the cavity to produce relatively even damage. Oh, 
Notice I say relatively even because this is a, a case where you have to do multiple experiments to get statistics on the damage to the system. And we used a gas gun. It didn't have to be a particularly large one, 32 millimeters. And we had a uh, atomic Doppler valence symmetry, a heterodyne valence symmetry um, system, a high speed camera. And the particular um, projectile we launched was a, 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 a Stanag style fragment. So basically a military um, style fragment that is meant to replicate real munition impact. You can discuss whether it's the correct shape, but this is very much what the sponsors wanted. So we're like, absolutely fine. And we could also do plate impact and step loading as long as we shot some fragments at the concrete the, uh, the funders were, were happy. And this shows the, the system in the, uh, in the cavity. We have uh, the, the target here. We come out and we take this uh, light from the PDV around the system using a series of mirrors. And we've got uh, some mirrors off to a high speed camera. And we get images uh, like that. We could calibrate, uh, look at the rear surface of the, of the system and see cracks developing out from the rear surface. Um, and that's looking over 30 millimeter by 30 millimeter field of view. And the, uh, we could see where the PDV was in the system. And that, in this case, the red dot shows where the photonic Doppler velocimeter was in the system. Again, we want to know what that sensor is actually looking at in this quite dynamic environment. And you could get velocity versus time. The, outward motion, the direction of the impact um, from the system, and we used a particular window in our um, analysis of our PDV trace, and we're showing it's going from you know, zero up to um, 70 meters per second over about you know, 60 microseconds, but basically the first 20 is where a lot of the um, action occurs. And if you look at the um, train suit software to look for cracks, this is the uh, failure pattern you get at break out in the system. We could also do fracture in a, a Kolsky bar, looking at surface fracture. There's a quite heavily pixelated image there. It's one frame from a high speed sequence. We analyzed various frames in the sequence. It, I appreciate it's quite pixelated, um, but you can again get the fracture pattern at breakout. And you can look over a number of samples. However, going to uh, the European Synchrotron Research Facility, um, we could look at um, through sample um, through sample um, effects on the system. So we can see subsurface damage here in the bulk of the material, and that was captured with a 25 nanosecond in frame time and you know reasonably good pixel resolution. And you can show, show where the cracks are in the bulk of the material. So using X-ray geography ESR, ESRF on these relatively small samples um, showed us about showed, gave us information on the crack nucleation growth in the system. Again, more research needs to be done there, and uh, there is a, a system for getting access to peak time at ESRF. So um, we did some simulations of the mechanics and the heating of the system. So we uh, used a console to work out the microwave field and the thermal heating. And then we used an abacus um, simulation for the mechanical impact. And this shows a um, quarter space. So this is the impact point in the middle here. This is a quarter of the uh, sample of your impact. This is a quarter space showing the um, stress buildup. And we used a very standard uh, Johnson Holmquist um, data model for the damage in the system. And these are the parameters we used in terms of the equation of state and the density and the shear process and the Capraga friction angle and the linear in invariant ratio and the dilation and the shear damage, et cetera, et cetera. So these were the parameters we used to the uh, the, the system. And here in the notes, it gives you an idea of the um, response of the material. You'll notice that uh, the, the Gleneisen gamma is 1.8. That was estimated based upon um, data from similar systems.
And here we see the material when there's fine aggregate present and heavy microwave damage. You can see on the left there that basically you've got what looks like granular flow. There is a um, high degree of uh, granularity in the system. And on the right hand side, uh, material that was undamaged. And you can see on the high speed sequence the crack formation before the final punch through. Absolutely fine. Um, so what can we do with that kind of data? Well, obviously, we can look at uh, the cracks. And the way we analysed this was to firstly separate out the fracture pattern of breakout. There you have it. That is where the um, projectile is, uh, has, put, has penetrated the um, sample to give us a similar reference point. Um, so one versus the other. Um, and then we put a um, radius at the where the projectile was. And from that radius, we drew a series of circles. And then we found out, we calculated the degree of connectivity between the um, the, cr the cracks in each radius. So on the left hand side, uh, there's lots of uh, cracks, uh, well, lots of damage developing in the system, and we can see where it is. On the right hand side, you can see uh, the, there are more definitely clear cracks in the system. And when you um, look at the, at the sample for fracture, what you find is you get a very localized form of connection. So for a material with lots of very clear fractures, you'll find that there is a high degree of connectivity um, out uh, through the system. And if you've got granular flow, so you've got a very kind of flat gradient in the system because there's not much connectivity in the, in the system. So uh, there is obviously a change there um, as you damage the system. The system is uh, less capable of transmitting stress, the um, sound speed changes, but also um, the ability to develop cracks changes as well. You get localized uh, granular flow, you don't tend to get long distance cracks being formed. Simulate those um, and put in damage parameters into the system. Again, uh, the request was that we have damage parameters that can be introduced into widely used models. So um, in this situation, we had a way of inducing gradient flow in the system. So in summary, the microwaves reduce the strength of the samples. They have a marked reduction in the compressive field strength of the system, and you can measure that with a, a bend test in the in instrum or low rate um, system. You can find a reduction of the shear modulus, and you can do that with measuring the sample with um, ultrasound and you'll find that granular flow or comminution increases as the microwave damage increases and this effect is much more notable much more clear than that of mechanical damage you will find it occurring almost as a um hallmark of the system and you can simulate this by reducing the minimum strain or damage initiation in the system. That is uh, the controlling factor for if you want to make your models reproduce um, the system. So it's minimum strain for damage in the modeling and system modeling uh, system. So where we are with this is that we're looking for um, uh, looking for those key numerical parameters for simulating microwave damage. As I said, these are the things compressive strength, shear modulus, and minimum strains for damage initiation. Those are the things we control. Um, we've got a validation methodology established for a laboratory characterization of materials, um, and we can use geometrically similar experiments at different strain rates. And it's pretty reproducible um, in terms of establishing that technique. So that actually brings me to the end. Damage. Um, is very much an area where people spend a lot of effort. There are 
a lot of different approaches, a lot of different damage uh, processes, damage mechanisms, which are possible. Temperature for polymer systems has a large effect. Um, for metals, you tend to find uh, the damage mechanisms have a certain degree of similarity up until you get really near the melting point. But for materials with a low strain to failure, such as concrete, or for um, polymers, you can find very uh, strong effects depending upon the thermal environment that the uh, material has been through. And again, that's that's quite useful. You can talk, tell me about annealing in metals, but there's really big effects can be found in polymers and uh, concrete at relatively modest temperatures. Now, this is the last of uh, these tutorials. So I thank you as the audience for um, the um, for your attention. But during this uh, presentation, I cited the work done by a lot of my uh, friends and colleagues, and I list some of them here. Okay, not all of them. Some of them are listed here. Uh, I'll, I'll mainly draw your attention to uh, John Field, um, Clive Sivier, Dave Williamson, Chris Braithwaite, Dave Chapman, Daniel Akins. These are people who are still active in the area of high strain rate studies. Other people have gone into medicine, they've gone into uh, finance, um, etc. They've gone into consultancies, um, but the people in, in black here in bold have been uh, those who have continued in the area of looking at uh, shock waves and damage uh, science. And uh, uh, quite a lot of the work has been done by final year physics students and MSE students. And also this was funded by a significant number of um, organizations, the Atomic Weapons the Atomic Weapons Establishment, Imperial College London, uh, Kinetic DSTL and the Defence Threat Reduction Agency, as well as uh, numerous other um, sources. So hopefully in this little catalogue of um, experiments, experiments during the last uh, couple of weeks, I hope you found something of interest. And uh, I'd just like to say uh, thank you and thank you for listening. I shall now stop sharing my screen because I think there's only so much of my screen you can cope with. Um, and just go back to speaking uh, directly to the camera. So thank you. They will, thanks a lot and thank you cordially uh, for this cycle that is very helpful for us, uh, containing many, many things. And okay. uh, uh, I think you know, I could express our joint opinion concerning all our team. And let me please um, to ask you concerning the current subject. Yeah. Uh, for instance, what about your conclusion? Because I think that technique uh, and methodology for uh, polymer dynamic study using, for instance, Kate Wilkinson bar um, needs some um, accuracy in the relaxation in, her, in a comparison of characteristic strain rates and large spectrum of relaxation time because we have very pronounced effect of the oblique refraction. What about your opinion? Yeah. Um, there is, so that, that, that is why we did multiple repeats on the same geometries um, as much as we could. Now, in terms of relaxation, for sure, putting the, the central hole down the system did uh, change the damage mechanism. And I was very keen to get this modeled. Um, and some people at a commercial company said this was very easy. And I was like, great, if it's easy, please do the easy thing. And um, they went away and then they came back later saying, actually, because the damage mechanism changed, it was really quite complicated. And I was like, okay. Um, I can measure the, the damage mechanism. So there is uh, the need for a deeper analysis of this data. Um, I'm very happy to share it with anybody who, who wishes to undertake that task, because I think there is a way of um, extracting more data on the damage mechanisms. The bulk properties of the material and the relaxation characteristics of the material, the bulk are well understood. However, the interaction of damage and temperature is still not clear. I think it's related to the material properties, fairly obviously, but I think there is a more complexity there. So, yeah, it definitely needs more analysis. 
Okay, okay, <coughs> Bill. <coughs> and now, if if we go, if we, we shall go to more intensive loading, um, mechanical plate impact, for instance, to compare ceramics and um, fused glass, for instance, fused mm -hmm. glass, and. Uh, what you remark concerning the qualitative difference between, uh, for instance, ceramic response and fused glass response concerning failure wave observation? So, so, failure, so the failure front um, observation. So, um, what what I what I can say is that um, finding the failure front, finding this um, nucleation and growth due to um, densification of the um, silica network structure in fused mm -hmm. glass is mm -hmm. relatively easily found. If you go looking for it, it's relatively easy to find. Um, we've A number of studies have been done to show we can track different velocities at different impact rates. We can also show the dependence upon um, composition. So finding bulk failure waves in um, glasses was relatively straightforward once you went looking for them. In ceramics, um, we found in the experimental range we studied, which was hitting um, ceramics with a tungsten flyer at 900 meters per second, so you know, fairly tough conditions. We found it, we found it difficult to initiate um, a failure front in the ceramic. However, if there was a cut in the sample, um, so some damage on the interface, in this case a cut to introduce the gauges, um, we found that um, if we could push material into the cut, we could initiate um, a failure at the front of the sample, which would then propagate through into the bulk of the material. So getting the initiation point um, was uh, much more is more difficult. Here's a higher energy um, process for ceramics. So all I can say is in the region we looked, we found that glasses produce mm -hmm. failure waves relatively easily once you know what you're looking for. Um, however, the uh, mm -hmm. ceramics were much harder materials generally, um, and they're mechanical strength meant that geometric shape became important for initiating failure in the sample but for mm -hmm. initiating failure waves in the bulk ceramics through shock we did not achieve that with the pressures we used and we were using pretty pretty strong pressures um so a tungsten plate going at a kilometer a second um when you hit it against the ceramic you're generating um almost 100 gigapascals of uh, shock pressure and we were not capable of initiating um, bulk failure waves in that situation. So that's kind of where my, my I'd say that's experimental evidence we've seen. I think it's possible to uh, produce failure fronts in ceramics and I think it will depend a lot upon how much amorph amorphous material you've got in the system and um, what um, free volume, for want of a better word, what the network of connections in that um, ceramic is. So I think it's possible that fairly waste, but I think it's going to be found uh, in, again, glassy ceramics, not in um, crystals, uh, not in strongly crystalline ceramics. And certainly the, the, the mesoscale structure is going to play an important part. So that's, okay. that's my that's okay. my viewpoint on the experiments I've from the experiments okay. I've done. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, colleagues, please, uh, you have the unique opportunity uh, to ask uh, Professor Prowl well, concerning everything. Well, it's, uh, well, it's unique. It's unique today, but but you can always ask me questions via email. And um, and I, I I downloaded the uh, Oleg. I downloaded the paper by uh, Fahad and Chakravarti and Field. The person okay. who actually drove that research was um, was was Avik Chak Chakravarti, the person in the middle. Um, he did a lot of that, um, a lot of that work um, in terms of setting up and driving it. And I'm gonna send you over some comments um, 
later. Okay. later. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill. Bill, and um, let me please to discuss with you because um, I think the beginning of December uh, could be very stressful for uh, everybody. And maybe uh, if, we, for instance, we will have plan on the second part of the next week to organize seminar with you participation with um, Matteo Bajoli participation with present with our presentation concerning um, our view on the study of uh, uh, shock liquid behavior and um, uh, due to the intensive flow to investigate uh, gate momentum state situation and also to, to discuss um, some our ideas concerning uh, um, set up to investigate this the second part of the next week it will be okay for you uh yeah yeah be, uh, certainly be okay i'll be very interested to see those results mm -hmm. um find out what, what what your group and what your associates have been doing um mm -hmm. so so yes so send, 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 send me the invite and mm -hmm. i'll and, and um, I'll do my best to attend. I realize there is a time difference, um, mm -hmm. but I'll do my best to attend. That's, that's kind of okay. Uh, I hope that this time, this time is, is convenient for you. This time, oh, yeah, that's, that's okay. No uh -huh. yeah, because time, for Matteo, it will be yeah, for Matteo, it will be uh, plus three. I think it's a uh, cool back settle for him also. Okay, okay. okay. And um, uh, I hope that colleagues. Uh, According to you, very kind proposal to, to send the question by email. They could use that. And um, please, uh, colleagues, uh, to prepare uh, together with me a seminar for the next uh, week, the second part of the week, with uh, kind agreement of, of Bill yeah. and Matteo to participate in this. Okay, okay. No uh, Bill, uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you. No problems. And I hope everybody. Uh, as, a, as I always say, a wonderful weekend, and I look forward to seeing the uh, the seminar next week. So, thank you much indeed, everybody, and have a have a wonderful time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.